Good morning. We get to rest in that he restores me today. And when I think of restoration, this is something you're going to learn about me today, is um, my dad was a mechanical engineer, and he, was, he only had two daughters, so he had no sons, but he decided that he loved cars and he loved old cars, and he taught me a lot about cars. So I had to know how to change my spot pl spark plugs, change my brake pads, how to change a tire, how to change the oil, and then it gave me the love of trying to restore a car. So this is not a picture of my car. I had a 69 Mustang, and because of the snow and cold, um, the pictures are out in the barn high up, and I did not get to them. But this is a Mustang. Um, and what I learned, I learned a lot when it comes to restoration because with a classic car, when you restore it, you have to have all the original parts or else it's not considered a true restoration. It has to be brought back to how it would be on a showroom floor. Well, the one thing you will learn about me today is that as uh, we're restoring this car, I was doing the interior of the car and that is not a fun job and I never choose to do that again. But we had a decision to make is, do we restore it to the classic original version or there's another word I learned that you can customize the car. So you can customize an old car. Well, I have a secret need for speed. So we customized it. We put nitrous on it so it would go faster. But what I realized when I talked and learned so much about restoration, I learned God's plan of restoration soon thereafter. Because for us, God is the ultimate restorer. You know, God walks with us and he created us in his image. That means he created us just so perfectly. And then sin entered the world and that loving, perfect relationship that we had was totally broken by sin. But even from the beginning when that happened, God planned a way to restore us back, to bring us back. He decided he would send his son, Jesus, who was scourged and then nailed to a cross to give us forgiveness for sin. And he didn't stop there, because then at that point, he died. And three days later, he rose from the dead to bring us the total restoration of giving us eternal life. That is a powerful thing to recognize that the God of the universe did that for each one of us that sits here today. And what I love even more is sometimes we deal with this whole forgiveness thing and we don't forgive ourselves. We don't believe it's actually happened. And what I love is that because I'm a visual object person, I realized God is a visual person too. So I found six scriptures that I want to illustrate with pictures that Anna found for me to tell you about what God does with our sin to help to make you stand in the restoration of recognizing Christ's death and resurrection was for you and that you are forgiven. The first one is Isaiah 118. It says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is what he does for us. Colossians 2:14. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he takes it away, nailing it to the cross. He erased it. Isaiah 38, 17, you have put all my sins behind your back. Can you see behind your back? No. Isaiah 44, 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, I have redeemed you. And this one is one of my favorites. Micah 7, 19. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities or our sins into the depths of the sea. Hurl all of them into the depths of the sea. You know what I love about this one? So they hurl all our sins into the depths of the sea. I think we need to put up a sign that says no fishing allowed because... It does us no good to go out on that sea with a hook and start dredging up our past sin. None. 
because it's forgiven. You are free, free indeed. So if he's taken it and he put it in the sea, don't go fishing for it. He's truly restored you. He's truly made you free. Um, Corey Tin Boone says this about it. He's, she says that if they're cast into the sea, how can we ever believe that we have the right to go get it? So I love that. That, that is the case. But even though we're redeemed and we have the Savior, we still live in this world. And this world is still full of hardships and things that cause us to be cast down. So today, I want to talk to us, how do we restore ourselves when we have these places? How do we move from downcast to being restored in our tribulations of life? Let's pray. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you will just loose the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach me and teach those here the power of your restoration in our life. Just come and let your word come to life, because without your spirit moving and coming to life, we are sitting helpless but we aren't because you are our hope and you come and you gather us as sheep and teach us and guide us we thank you lord in jesus name amen so what does god's res restoration bring to us it brings us back to a state of new strength vigor and gives us an eternal perspective when we allow the lord to restore us he rebuilds us. He repairs us from all of our frayed nerves, our worriedness, and our worn-out bodies. And I know, know about you, but I need some restoration, and it's almost a daily thing. Psalm 42, 11 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why do so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Cast. That word actually directly relates to sheep. And Pastor Dan at the beginning of the series mentioned about sheep and what that means, but it's an old English term for sheep that have been turned over. They say that it's really a pathetic sight because these sheep go and they stray off and they get into this little shallow dip and they decide to lay down and then they kind of move a little bit and then before you know it, they're like this. Sheep's feet have no joints, they just are like this. So here is this sheep just laying here like this. It is pathetic. <laughs> and it's important that the sheep finds them in a very short period of time because the sheep will die. Because the sheep is helpless to turn themselves over. Isn't that like us? We were helpless in our sin, and the shepherd came and helped us to stand upright because we were helpless without him. And that is why the shepherds actually count their flock every day. They go through and they count and make sure of their sheep. They don't want to find one missing. And if they find one missing, they go out looking because they know that a sheep that has gone astray falls prey to a predator. Isn't that the same for us? When we are discouraged and we go through trials or we go through things and we kind of stray away, all of a sudden we start hearing other things and believing not the truth because there's a predator out there looking for us when we are down. You know, it's funny that I found out some other things about sheep. One of the main things about sheep is that they can have too much wool. And I'm thinking, okay, a sheep is made to have wool, but they can have too much wool because if they have too much wool, what happens, they can be weighted down. It can get full of burrs and it can get full of mud. It can get stuck in the bushes. It has a problem. It gets debris in it. Don't we get weighed down by things in our life too? We can get laid down with it. But what I found out is that then the sheep, the shepherd would go and get the sheep that were always overflowing with all this wool, and they would have to shear the sheep. Well, I thought, okay, a sheep would be happy about this. I found out that sheep do not like to be sheared. They have to stand still, and then a shepherd comes at them with a very sharp object to shear the wool off of them. And he shears the wool off of them to give them freedom, to help them not be weighed down, to not get caught. Doesn't our good shepherd do that with us sometimes? We're weighed down by our life burdens, by maybe a sin, by maybe just something that has come across that brought us grief. And sometimes we just have to go and stand and be alone with him. And he has to shear off those hard places in our life so that we can gain freedom from not getting stuck in a thicket. 
It's interesting to note, too, that no high priest could actually go into the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament because wool represented sin. And that sin represented pride, self-worth, in the sense of meaning a personal preference on things. So the shepherd would always watch the sheep and notice if they were getting burned down with wool and then would take it aside and shear it. Sometimes we tumble into life's trenches <laughs> We need the shepherd's power to bring with his strong hands to reach down around us and just pick us up and restore us. 2 Corinthians 7, 6 says, But God who comforts the downcast. Aren't you grateful he does that? Are you cast down? Is your world upside down? Are you unable to right yourself? How can we possibly go on when life has knocked us down? Well, there's hope, and it's in the simple scripture of Psalm 23, 3. He restores my soul. The he there is God, the good shepherd. God, the good shepherd, the one who created everything. He is the one that can do it. The word restores there, I love this word restore because it means to restore vitality, vigor, and strength. Who doesn't need more vitality, vigor, and strength? I need it. And it says he restores it, that he gives me that strength. He gives me that power to make it through the muck and guck of life because life is full of it. And what's interesting enough is that word restore is actually in the present tense. It simply means that he does it immediately. How many fathers or mothers or people, when their child comes running to them and says, I'm sorry, I just broke your favorite vase, goes, oh, maybe 14 years from now, I will forgive you. Nobody. God does that with us. When we come running to him, he restores us immediately. He doesn't put it off. He doesn't say, well, let me think about it. It says it's in the present tense. He does it now. He restores. You know, we do have so many hardships in life, and he knows that. He knows that we suffer surgeries and cancers and illnesses and deaths and broken relationships and accidents and disappointments and betrayals. But the list can go on and on. But he's the good shepherd, and he restores through all of those things. But there's also a time in life sometimes when we're on the verge of compassion fatigue. Have you ever been to the point where you have given so much compassion, you keep doing the right things, and you're thinking, why do I keep doing this? I don't think it's going to help anything. That you keep giving and giving and giving, and you're looking around going, God's supposed to be the God of this world, but man, it's just always something else, something else. Sometimes we need to be restored to just continue to walk in the way of compassion in the way of mercy, because the world pulls at our souls. The next word is my. I love that, my, meaning me. He's directly talking to me, or he's directly talking to you. It's not your neighbor, it's not your kids, it's not anybody else he's talking to you, that he restores my. It's a personal thing. It's just you. You. And then it says soul. The Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, and the word means life. It means the person who we are. It's not the dust that we came from, but it's that inner essence, the soul that's made in the image of God himself. So this is our question. How do we go on, and how do we deal with all those sapping things in life? We find it in that Psalm 23. It's in God alone, God's tender care. The first two verses of Psalm 23 promised that he would care and provide for us. And then he said he'd give us rest and peace. And now he says he's going to restore us. So this is an other promise. You know, this reminds me of God being our healer with the Egyptians. They were released and they went out into the wilderness and they were thirsty and they wanted drink. And they got to Mara and there there was just a bitter well. The water was just full of of bitterness and death and it was undrinkable but Moses who had been a shepherd for so many years realized where he needed to go he ran to God the good shepherd and asked him about it and he, Moses found out that God had told him go and take this certain tree and put it in the water and it will make it sweet it will make it sweet so right there God took their physical need and turned it into a spiritual issue he took a bitter experience and made it sweet he can do that for us. Are you going through a bitter experience? He can make it sweet. He is the God who heals. He is the one 
that goes to the cast downs and lifts them up. It's also interesting that I found out the strongest, the healthiest, and the fattest sheep are the ones that are cast down the most. It's not the weak, frail ones, because when they find this little shallow place to go lay down in, they kind of wrestle their body like this to stretch out, these legs that just kind of just go straight up, and then their center of gravity kind of goes whoop, and they're caught. But what happens when they're actually caught in that little crevice and cast down is so important. All of a sudden, the gases in their stomach start building up, and those gases in the stomach then make their limbs go numb so they can't feel them anymore. And if it's sunny, the sheep will only last for a few hours. If it's cloudy, it could be a couple days. But if the sheep has a you in them, then that you will die too. All this can cause such problems. So that's why the shepherd keeps a close look. And one of the clues that the shepherd keeps a close look on his flock is if he sees buzzards flying around, he realizes one of his sheep are gone. He realizes the predators realize that something's in trouble and he needs to go find them. Remember the lost story of the lost sheep story that Jesus told in Matthew? He says, if a man holds owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 in the hill and go look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than the 99. He goes to look for that sheep. Some of us feel that when we failed or we've sinned or gone too far, that God is disgusted, mad, or upset with us and that he's not there. You know, there's nothing you can do. There's not any place that you can run or be so far away that the shepherd is not there waiting to restore you. He will run hard and fast over you no matter where you are and how fast you run. For Jesus has such a heart of compassion that when he came, he actually went to the cast sheep. He went to those that were not the righteous Mark 2, 17 puts it this way. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people do not need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So how does the good shepherd restore his sheep? For one, he searches. He is always searching for you. He's searching all the time. And restoring how he restores the sheep. I love this image of how the shepherd restores the sheep. The shepherd would go out looking and he would find the sheep with its legs straight up like this. And what would he do? He would go down and he would pick that shepherd up and would put it in its lap. And then it would start massaging its legs because remember the legs would go numb. And after he tenderly massaged its legs, he would then put it down to the side and put its sweet head on its lap. And then he would rub the sweet head of the sheep and whisper in its ears about how much it was cared for and how much it's loved. And then after some time, he would stand it up next to him and the sheep would lean against its leg to get its balance. And then the sheep would then take its little legs and waddle and then fall and the shepherd would go after it and stick it back up again and then it would try again and it would fall and the shepherd would pick it up and then eventually the shepherd would watch and the sheep would get his legs and he'd go running off but he didn't stop then because the good shepherd knew that until that sheep actually ate green grass it was not well it needed to get back into feeding on what would give it life and substance. The shepherd watched until there was total restoration. And this is hard, because life is hard for us, but that is how our good shepherd is. But sometimes we get in the way. There's this great shepherd's quote, um, the shepherd from New Zealand. He says, problems are not the problem. But the problem is in trying to cope with problems on our own and with our own resources and in our own strength or weaknesses without the help of the shepherd. 
Now, I'm sure none of you do this, but I do that often, try to fix my own problems because I think I have the solution. And really, when I do it in my own strength and own power, I tend to get deeper like in sand, quicksand. And I thought about this, and I thought about what are some of the things that get us to this point where we need the Good Shepherd to restore us? And these are just a few, but I'm sure you can come up with your own. It's when we're running too long, when we're just running, 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 and we've never been still enough to hear him. The shepherd must revive us. When we're running on empty, the shepherd has to refresh us. If we have nothing to give, we're on empty, and he needs to fill us. This is one of them that's really hard. When we're running with the wrong people, you know, when you're running with the wrong people and you're listening to not truths, the shepherd sometimes has to replace them. When you're running away, you know, we tend to isolate when we feel shame or depression or isolation or lonely. We run away, but then the shepherd comes to retrieve us. Or sometimes we just run scared. We just run scared and the shepherd needs to refocus us. So I thought about one of the strongest people in the Old Testament, one of the strongest great prophets of old is in 1 Kings 18, and it's Elijah, and you have heard the story about Elijah and that he was out on Mount Carmel and that there was the worshipers of Baal, and so he set up that they needed to prove who was the real God, and so the people of Baal, they were there, and they were trying to get their God to take the sacrifice that was up there and there's kind of a part of Elijah, you know, that was antagonistic, and I'm like, oh, that's the human side of you, isn't it? Because he would go, well, I don't think he's listening. You better yell louder. And then came nighttime, and it was Elijah's turn. And Elijah says, okay, well, just now fill this place with water. Put so much water on all these sacrifices, and we will prove that God is God. And all of a sudden, whew, fire from the sky comes down and totally takes care of the sacrifices and makes everything dry because the real God, Jehovah, so up. What an amazing accomplishment. And then what happens? Elijah received word that Ahab's wife Jezebel was seeking to kill him. 1 Kings 19. One woman was after him. Hmm, that's another sermon some other time, but one woman was after him after he had just seen what had happened. And what did he do? He ran. He ran. And he finally fell down in total weariness and rolled over and gave up. The largest, strongest prophet of old. In 1 Kings 19, he says, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the bush and went to sleep. Have you ever felt that way? I'm done. What, ha what did the good shepherd do? He had an angel touch him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and God provided him bread and water. And then the angel of the Lord came back again, and the second time touched him and said, get up and eat. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, what are you doing? And this is it. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And guess what? I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Have you ever been so isolated you feel like you're the only one? That is so not true. And so then what did God do? He says, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And then not in the storm or in the earthquake or in the fire or anything else. There was just a gentle whisper. And the Lord spoke to him. And he says, go back the way you came and go to the desert. And you're going to go anoint a king. He gave him something to do. So he gave him physical care, the rest, the food, and the drink. He talked with him. And you notice he also listened to him to all of his discouragement, dismay, and how he felt. And then he gave him something to do, a plan. God kept right on in the ministry of restoring his precious sheep, Elijah. 
And I think, oh my goodness, that, that strong man of God came to that exhaustion and discouragement. What about little old me, a you? But God says it's the same. It doesn't matter. He restores all of us. The shepherd gave him something to do, and the reason why is because, you know what, Elijah eventually became so comfortable in his muck and guck that he just decided to give up and stay there. Sometimes we need that push to go and do, to step out of our comfort zone. When was the last time you stretched yourself in doing something? When was the last time you stretched yourself in relating to somebody else and going and doing, or really digging in deep and giving your life to something that you weren't sure that you wanted to do? He had something to do, and he did it. He went beyond. And I love this. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, And let us consider how we spur one another towards love and good deeds. He gives us one another to spur us on to those things, to spur us on to the love and good deeds that we should be doing, which brings joy. So now the Lord heals, and he pursues us, and he supplies all our need. What are three practical ways that he can actually restore us? Because we all need restoration. Just like that car from going from the rust into the beauty of restoration. That's what God does with us. And here's three practical ways we can do this. We can feed on God's word. The word is actually what restores our soul. Not the TV entertainment or a sitcom or food or drink or a drug or a vacation or another book. Not that those are all bad things, but that's not what restores our soul. Not another trip to the mall. The way to touch and be restored is to get into the living word, which is powerful, that can direct us directly to him. It says a generous application of God's word to our lives each day does wonders to restore our soul. We can also commune with the God through prayer. There's an interesting fact in a book called Shepherdology. It's about each sheep. You know, there's the sheep, and the shepherd goes to each sheep, and every day there's a graze line. And all the sheep line up in this graze line, and one by one, they have an intimate time with the shepherd. He reaches down and pulls them up, just like this tarnished silver plate or the car that needs restoration or us and the shepherd each day meets with them and as he meets with them he sits there and he rubs them all over he touches them tenderly holds them head in his hands and speaks refreshment to them And as he does this every day, he's checking for the things that could weigh them down. And then when he's done, the sheep have been restored. They've been refreshed and they've been renewed because they've been with the shepherd. We need that in prayer. We need to come and just sit in his hands and let him speak to us and restore us. What a blessing to be able to leave the cares of our life for just a brief period of time and just curl up in our shepherd's lap and let him speak intimately through us and to us. And then the third thing is we need to call on the Holy Spirit. God's given us the Holy Spirit. That's what seals us for that day when we will have the redemption of the restoration to its fullest is the day we see him face to face. And this is it. What is the fruit of the Spirit? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are all things of restoration. When we're restored, this is the things that we can rest in that intimate fellowship with him. So if you're cast down or your world's upside down, I hope you know that you have a savior that is your shepherd that searches for you, provides for you, and his healing touch restores you. He restores you because he heals your spirit. He restores you when you're cast down. He draws you back when you're unsure. He relieves you when you're hurt. He rescues you when you are in danger. But this is a key thing. 
There's the word rest, R-E-S-T, and there's the word resist. The only difference between resist and rest in letters is the letter I. If you resist him, you will not find restoration. But if you rest in him, you will. So as the band comes back and gets ready to lead us in a song, I, I pray that you, if you're here today and you've never met the Savior and you just need him to be the good shepherd to you, don't let the opportunity to come to know Christ today go by. But if you are a sheep that just needs restoration because life has got you down and you've gotten cast down and you're in a little shallow hill, little shallow puddle with your feet like this and you're not able to turn right side, come. There's prayer nailers. There's people that can pray with you. But just meet the good shepherd right where you're at. Because he wants all of us to leave here restored and refreshed in him. Let's pray. Father, we need your restoring presence. We need your spirit to speak into our hearts and lives so that we can just rest in you. Forgive us when we resist and we put our own way of doing things. Come meet us right now. Do it again and again like you've always done, searching after us hard and just picking us up. And as we, as a people today, rest in your lap, knowing that your hands are on our face, speaking life and goodness into us and telling us how much you love us, may we feel your restoration touch because you are the good shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.